If you have your uh, Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 10 to start with today. Hebrews chapter 10. Actually, we might be there the whole time. <clears throat> Hebrews 10. Uh, and I'm going to start with this. Valerie thinks I've probably told it before many times, uh, this, uh, this joke. So if I have, just bear with me. Uh, I, I like to use it anytime I can. Uh, and I know I say it at the house, but I can't remember everywhere now that I, uh, that I tell it. So um, you can pretend. No, that's lying. Don't pretend that you haven't heard it before. Um, you can just give me courtesy laughs. We'll be okay. Um, three, pastor, three pastors were getting together for coffee one day, and they found that all their churches had problems with a squirrel infestation. I should have changed it to mice, right? Um, I got so mad, said one of them, I took a shotgun and I fired at them. I made holes in the ceiling and the walls, but it did nothing to the squirrels. I tried trapping them alive, said another, said the second pastor, and then I drove 50 miles out of town before releasing them, but they all beat me back to the church. <laughs> I haven't had any more problems, said the third. What did you do? They asked. They were all in a maze. And he said, I baptized them and I made them members, and I haven't seen them since. <laughs> I just can't help it. Uh, it's just too funny, right? <laughs> So even if you had heard it, thank you. That was, that was a good laugh. Uh, in, our, in our day of uh, technology and the digital age, I guess, uh, you could say, um, we often have the same problem as the squirrels. Uh, we wonder, you know, why do we have to gather for worship? Why do we have to come together on Sunday to worship? Why can't I just sit home, I sit at home with my pajamas on my couch, with my coffee and my muffin, uh, and just watch the live stream? Why do I have to, to come to church? Why isn't that a, a suitable substitute for church? And we really want to kind of answer that question today. But just for starters, uh, one reason why you can't do that is imagine if everybody did that. If everybody thought that same way, we would be doing what we did last year, right? Uh, during uh, COVID, um, nobody would be here and we wouldn't have a visible representation of the church in the world. And yes, the church is the people. It's not the building. We can't really call ourselves a church if we never gather, if we never gather with that church. And number two, there's a corporate component to walking with Christ. There's a corporate component to worshiping God, one that can't be done sitting at home, one that can't be done just by watching the live stream. And we see that reflected in our church covenant, which I think you all have a copy, thanks to... Christy, for making those copies of it uh, available to you today, um, but I think you have one uh, near you anyway. Uh, being a meaningful member, which is what we're talking about, is reclaiming meaningful membership. It's certainly about more than what we do in this building, but being a meaningful member also includes what we do in this building. And that's what we want to look at today, and that's the next section of our covenant. Uh, I'll read the first part. It says, having been as we trust, brought by divine grace to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and to give ourselves wholly to him, we do now solemnly and joyfully covenant with each other to walk together in him with brotherly love to his glory as our common Lord. And so we do therefore in his strength promise to do the following things. And last week we looked at this one, that we will exercise a Christian care and watchfulness over each other and faithfully warn, exhort, and admonish each other as occasion may require. And then today... It says that we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but will uphold public worship of God and the ordinances of his house. And we'll look at that second part next week, the ordinance of his house. That's why communion is not set up uh, today, because we want to spend an extended period of time looking at the ordinances, and we want to celebrate com communion as we, as we talk about that. So that's why you'll notice, hey, it's the first, I thought it was the first Sunday. It is. Um, but we're going to discuss communion next week, and, and we'll share communion together at that same time. So today we're going to look at why meaningful membership demands a commitment to gather together. Why our meaningful membership demands a commitment to assemble with one another. And we see it in our text today, Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. <clears throat> a familiar text. We've gone over this before. But it says this, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living, new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you now, and, and we are grateful uh, that we have uh, your word uh, in our language uh, so that we can study it, we can look at it, we can, uh, and ultimately, Lord, we can obey it. Uh, and Father, we thank you for your spirit that you give to us who enables us to obey it. Uh, for without that, we, we would not be able to do this. It is in your strength uh, that we can carry out what we have before us today. And so, Father, we pray that as we uh, look at this uh, text, as we look at uh, why it is so important for us to gather uh, together as a church family, we would ask that you would uh, open up our hearts and our minds, help us to submit uh, to your word, and help us to be faithful to that word as well. And we pray that as we uh, look at this this morning, that you would be magnified and you would be glorified in everything that we do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> as you can tell, my voice is still struggling from the cold. Uh, so we may have to use the water a little bit more this week, but... Um, so today, as I said, we look at why meaningful membership demands, or that it demands, a commitment to assemble. And our gathering really is essential for two main reasons. Uh, yes, there is a sense in which we gather to grow. We do that. We gather to be encouraged. We gather to be challenged. But ultimately, before that, we gather to worship God, right? To draw closer to Him, which is ultimately the right response to His revelation to us. So before, about, before it's about us, it's always about God. It's about God and others, which is what we see in our text. So we gather to worship God, and we, we gather to build each other up. And so those are really the two main reasons that we want to look at for why we come together as a church. Uh, we are here for others. We're here for God. It's not about us. Right? The gathering on Sunday is not a, not a spectator sport. That's why online church doesn't meet the requirements of, of church. Uh, we have to be here. Um, if you're sitting in the, in the seats, you are not the audience. God isn't even really the audience. He's the object of our worship. And so ultimately we're here to, to be drawn close to God, to worship Him, and we're here to use our gifts to build each other up. That's why we're here. So let's look at those two reasons. There are two reasons that we must commit to assemble is number one, to build up or to edify. And that's what we see here in Hebrews uh, 10 verses 24 and 25. And just to give you a little bit of background about Hebrews, uh, you're familiar with it, but it was written primarily to Jewish Christians uh, who were being persecuted. Um, <clears throat> they had come to faith in Christ and they found out that being a Christian wasn't easy. In fact, many of their fellow uh, Jews were making life difficult for them, and so they're wondering, what have I got myself into? Uh, this is not easy. So, so many were tempted to, and many had turned back to their old way of living because it was easier. They didn't face the difficulties. Uh, and so the writer of Hebrews writes to say, don't, don't do that. Don't do that because Jesus is better. Jesus is superior to the old ways. He's superior to the old covenant. He's superior to the old sacrifices, to the old priest system. He's, ser he's superior to all of it. So don't bail out on Jesus. Don't leave Jesus behind. Keep going. Stick with him because ultimately Jesus is worth it. That's kind of the idea of Hebrews in a nutshell. There's more to it than that, but that gives you a, a general uh, summary. And then this text in chapter 10 is given in the context of, of Christ's once and for all sacrifice, that through his blood we have salvation, we have forgiveness, we have access to God the Father, and we have a boldness because we have a Savior and a high priest who gives us that access, who gives us that boldness, who gives us that forgiveness. And so because of who we are in Christ and because of what we have in Christ, then there are expectations for us. And that's what we see as we start walking through this let us patch here in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. If you read through it, you notice that because of these things, he says in verse 
uh, 22, let us draw near. And then 23, let us hold fast. And then verse 24, let us consider one another. That's the, the quote unquote let us patch. Uh, but we want to look at that third uh, head of let us right now, if you will, and look at why we must commit to gather. Verse 24, he says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so from this text, it's really clear that any notion that we may have that we can live out our Christian life in isolation is unbiblical. It's unwise, and it's disobedient. This text right here implies that, that we need each other to grow in Christ, to stay close to Christ. And that's why we cannot forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Right, verse 25, he says, we are to consider others, we're, to, we're not to forsake gathering with them. And the word for, forsake here is a word that means to cast off, to put aside, to, to leave it behind, to, to kind of take it off and just leave it there, to be done with it, to give it up, a complete denial. I'm washing my hands of it. That's what it's talking about. And so it's warning against that. While this is not a straightforward command that says you must gather with your church, it's, there's a warning not to forsake it, so the gathering is implied, isn't it? It's like, it's already in place, your commitment to gather, so don't leave it behind. It assumes that, that as Christians, as a church family, you will get together. Because it's in the gathering that this building up occurs. And so it says, don't abandon your previously established commitment because you need each other to grow in Christ. You need to be there to build up one another in Christ. And so here this call is to remain faithful, to gather, to refuse to forsake it, because you have a ministry to others here. In verse 24, he says, Consider one another to provoke them to love and good works. Don't forsake your gathering. Don't leave it behind. Instead, be there, be together, so you can build up your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And so these verses, what they do is they eliminate the idea that me showing up on Sunday is about me. That I can sit it out if I want to, I can show up if I want to, because it doesn't matter to anybody but me. My faith is mine. No, it's not just about you. Right? Even if I lie to myself and I convince myself that I don't need anybody else to help me walk with Christ, even if I can say that that is true, somebody else might need me to help with their walk with Christ, right? So, so if you think, well, I don't need to go to church, I don't need to gather on Sunday because I got this thing down, right? I'm walking with Christ. I'm super duper spiritual, and, and I don't need anybody else's help. Well, maybe there's somebody here that needs your help, right? Isn't that what it's saying? It's saying consider one another. Don't, don't, don't consider yourself. Don't say, well, think about it and think if you need to be there or not. No, you need to be there because you need to consider somebody else. Maybe they need you there. Maybe you're just the person that they need to see or want to see. Because you can help them grow in Christ by being there. You can't by not being there. I mean, think about the context here. These Christians are under fire. They're facing persecution. It's dangerous to go to church. It's dangerous to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. So it is a risk to get out of bed in the morning and to go to church. There are risks people take all over the world. And so these risks here had caused some to abandon their church families. It led many to go back to Judaism, to their old ways of living. They didn't have the freedoms that we have today. I don't think any of us had to evade the authorities to get here. We didn't have to show up under the cloak of darkness and camp out. And we didn't have to wear a disguise, even though Alex did. He was dressed up as Spider-Man if you didn't see him. I guess he thought people were, would out him as a Christian if, <laughs> if he was in church. But there was no clandestine operation to get you here safely. In the first century church, there was. There was a fear of being caught. There was a fear of being outed as a Christian. And that prevented people from gathering with their church family. Yet God still says, don't forsake it. Right? If anybody had an excuse to not be there, it's them. God didn't say, well, you know, since it's difficult, skip out. No, he didn't say that. He said it's essential to meet together. 
and think of the encouragement that that is. You're risking your life to meet with your church family, and there are others there next to you. And also think of the discouragement when you're risking your life to meet with your church family, and nobody's there. Or somebody's missing. What goes through your head? Were they caught? Am I going to see them again? Are they in jail? Did they get killed? All of those questions would come to mind in the first century. You mean you look around, you're, you're singing, and, and you, you notice, you know, they're not there, they're not there. Did they leave the faith? Did they leave the church? Did they, what happened? I mean, they couldn't just call them up afterwards either, right? They, they couldn't do that. How disheartening is it if you don't see them? I mean, you don't know what happened. How disheartening is it you risked your life to get there and others weren't willing to do the same? It wears you down. But like I said, the other side is also true. Given the context, the struggles, the challenges, the doubts that you face during the week, to then come together and see others who face those same challenges, those same struggles, those same uh, doubts, and they're there. They're there with you. They're there singing praise to God. That's a huge blessing. That's a source of strength. Now I can go. I can go throughout the week because I know that we're going to come back together and we're going to do this again next week. I feel alone out there, right, in, the, in amongst the, uh, the, the bad guys, the wolves, if you will, <clears throat> those who are out to get me. It's hard. I'm taking a beating. But then I get to come together with my church family, and I know I'll be, I'll be there with them. I know they'll be there. That's strengthening. That's encouraging. Right? Knowing that no matter what happens during the week to get me down, I can count on seeing my brothers in arms, my, my, my sisters in Christ, there on Sunday, singing praise to the Lord. I mean, even today, I mean, we have, we're not under fire like this, but it's still an encouragement to see everybody here, isn't it? And it's discouraging when people refuse to be here. And I don't mean because of sickness or work or vacations or anything like that. We understand that there are certain circumstances that don't allow for uh, people to be here as much as they want to be. I'm talking about those who decide they have better things to do. Those who are habitually absent. I mean, if you think about it, what is more important than honoring your Lord and Savior on the Lord's day? Gathering with your church family on the Lord's day. And it's important for us to be here because, well, number one, we, we promised as members that we would not forsake the assembly, that we wouldn't go into hiding, that we wouldn't stay away. And also, because we aren't here for selfish reasons. We, don't, we stay home for selfish reasons, but we don't gather for selfish reasons. That's what verse 24 says, right? Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Well, this is something that we looked at last week that should be done habitually, not just on Sundays. This particular passage is written in the context of assembling together. It says, consider each other. Consider one another. That is, think about the rest of your church family when you're deciding that you have better things to do on Sunday. Consider your church and be there to provoke them to love and good works. And we've looked at that word provoke before. It was used to describe a sudden outbreak of sickness or spasms. It was an irritant, uh, like the, the rock in your shoe or something like that. But, like that. but here it's used in a positive way to, to motivate, to stir that person up, to get them going. Right? Because, again, the context uh, of what is happening, they're getting down. It's hard, and so they needed that, that push to stay close to Jesus Christ. We need that. We need that. <clears throat> we need to help each other grow to be more like Christ. And so what this means is it means that our gathering to worship is less about what I get out of it. It's more about what I'm willing to put into it. 
means I don't skip out on corporate worship because I'm expected to be there to stir up others, to motivate others, to love God and love others. And I can't do that on my couch, eating my muffin, sipping my coffee. Right? Just like you can't do, you can't, we can't influence those who are younger in the faith if we're not here. In fact, it might have the opposite effect. If you want to influence my kids for Christ, you want to be an example to them, you want to encourage them, build them up in the faith, be here. If you're not here, it's like, where was so-and-so? Where were they? Well, they're not building you up in Christ, are they? They're kind of getting you down. They're more likely to notice that. Our covenant and our commitment to Christ and His church requires us to be faithful to assemble on the Lord's day. And this is not a legalistic thing. It shouldn't be a legalistic thing. We should gather because we have a desire to build up this local body, to stir each other up in love and good works. And we gather to be stirred up as well. Let's make no mistake about it. That, that's a benefit. Because we all need each other in order to stick close to Jesus Christ. And so he says, gather to consider, consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. That's, that's maturity, right? If you think of Jesus, what do you think? He was full of love and good works. And so here, we, this is implied that we cannot grow in love and good works alone. We need the help of each other. And so this cannot happen in isolation. And I know it goes against our modern individualistic tendencies that we can do it ourselves. But being a follower of Jesus Christ, being a Christian, being a meaningful church member means that we're in this together. Yes, our our relationship with Christ is personal, but it's not private. We need the church, and we need to gather faithfully to, to help each other grow. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, he's warning this congregation, he's saying, you know, don't go back. Don't forsake your church family. Don't leave your church. Love your church. Don't desert it. Devote yourself to it. Don't bail on them. Build them up. Don't stay home. Show up. And he says, do so in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we get closer to to Christ's return, let's do this more. The word exhort we looked at last week ultimately means to walk alongside somebody in order to warn them, encourage them, correct them, instruct them, or comfort them, whatever it is that they need. Ultimately, for the purpose of strengthening and securing the faith of another. And showing up to church being here is one way to do that. Because if you ever see anyone, you can't encourage them. In other words, the church needs you and you need the church. And so we don't go to church to check it off a list, to earn points with God or anything like that, to say, hey, see God, I, I did my time. Now reward me accordingly. That's not what we do, right? We're, we're doing this to build each other up. It's not, a, it's not a sporting event or a concert. No, we come here for a purpose, to help each other grow into Christ-like maturity. And so one of the ways that we do that is just by being here. And so the writer here of Hebrews is convinced that the breathtaking glory of the gospel is embodied and worked out in our weekly gatherings. As we show up and as we build each other up. And so it's in this local assembly that we can and we should be asking, how are you doing, right? And I don't mean just the, the pleasantry, how you doing? Good, bye. Not like that, but how are you really doing? Everything all right in your life? You know? how, how can I pray for you? Is there anything I can help you with? Is there a burden that, that, that's weighing you down that I can help you with, that I can bear with you? That was kind of the idea here. They needed each other and so do we. We're to walk alongside each other, stand next to each other, cheer each other on. Because again, let's, let's, let's face it, the world out there is it's a mess, right? It's bickering and, and bitterness and destruction, and it's not honoring to God. And wear you down, 
and get you down. And that's why we get to come together, to be lifted up, to be built up. That's why God gives us this, this blessing known as the church, not to join in the negativity, but to be strengthened, to be encouraged. You know, this is our, our home field. This is, we drew, this is Sunday is when we come together in a huddle, right, before we go out into the, the field, into the battle. This is our refuge. This is like the, the embassy in a foreign land. It's safe here. We have each other. We have each other's backs. It's our home field. And we're to consider how we can stir each other up, how to encourage each other. Right? That's why we're together. That's why we should not forsake this, because this should be the greatest day of the week. We get to come together and, and, and build each other up. It's important to be here with your church family, to build that family up. I read a story of a, a pastor who went, I don't know if it's a true story or not, because I've seen it in millions of different places. But it was a, a pastor who went, to a, <clears throat> who went to visit a man from his, his church who had neglected the Sunday gathering. The man was sitting by the fire in his home, uh, watching the, the warm glow of the coals on a cold winter day. And the pastor's sitting there, and he's pleading with the man to be more faithful to his church family, but the man was as cold as the winter day. He remained unmoved, and so the pastor took the tongs <clears throat> that were sitting by the fireplace, and he, he used those tongs to reach in and, and remove, or to separate the coals from each other. And so he stood there in, in silence for a little, while, a little while and watched as those coals that were once piping hot were now cold. And the pastor said, that's what's happening in your life, he told the man. As soon as you separate yourself from God's people, the fire goes out. The man got the message then. And we need to get that message too. As soon as we separate ourselves from God's people, the fire goes out. To keep that fire burning, we need to be together. It's, the gathering, it's in the gathering of this church that we're able to, to care for others and be cared for by others. We're able to love others and be loved by others. To forgive others and be forgiven by others to encourage others and be encouraged by others. It's here so that we can keep that fire going. So meaningful membership demands a commitment to assemble on the Lord's Day so that we can build each other up. But secondly, as reflected in our covenant, meaningful membership demands a commitment to assemble in order to worship, offer up worship to our God. So we build up and we offer up. And make no mistake about it, the building up is an act of worship as well. I'm not trying to minimize that. But our covenant says we commit to gather to build up people and we gather together to offer up praise. Ultimately, we are here to worship God. And it says that we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but will uphold public worship of God and the ordinance of it, ordinances of his house, which are also acts of worship. And we will look at those again next week. But meaningful membership means we commit to gather so that we can worship God together. If you look up uh, in verse 19, <clears throat> he says, in following, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and, li new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's the language of worship right there. Right? In worship, we draw near to God. You and I, were created to worship, right? God has made us as worshipers, and we will always worship something. Right? <clears throat> Sin is worshiping something other than God, right? But we're not only created for worship, we're redeemed for worship. And God has required us, he requires us to worship. And he's given us the ability to worship. And we see in that text, it's because of Jesus Christ that we have that access to the Father. Because in him, we have a great high priest. We have a savior. He says a high priest over the house of God, which is the church. 
And because we have such a glorious God and a glorious Savior with such unprecedented access to Him, we should make it a habit of drawing near to Him continually. Let us offer up continually the sacrifices of praise. Let us continually, faithfully worship Him. There is no one else who is worthy or deserving of our worship. Revelations 4, 10, and 11, Revelation 4, 10, and 11, it says the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Make no mistake about it, God alone is worthy and deserving of our worship. And he calls you and me to do just that. So what is worship? Well, there are a lot of ways in which we can describe worship, but a couple of New Testament words give us uh, some hints. One word means to kiss the hand. It means to bow down before. And so worship is humble reverence and honor given to someone. That's at the core of what it means to worship God, isn't it? It means to to honor Him, to, to celebrate Him. It's our loving response to who he is as he's revealed himself in Scripture. That's worship, right? It's our response to to who God is. It's giving him honor and devotion because he deserves it, because of his infinite worth. Really, worship, you could say, is all about loving him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, which also leads to our loving one another, which was point number one. So we could always boil this down to the the great commandment, couldn't we? Our lives are all about worshiping God. They should be. And you might say, well, why do we need to do it together? Why can't I just worship God on my own? I I worship better at home. I worship better uh, on the mountain or uh, while I'm fishing or at the ball game. Well, you should be worshiping God wherever you are. You should do that by all means. You should worship God every single day of your life, alone with your family. You should, and and that worship really should fuel your Sunday worship. So you should be worshiping outside of this gathering, and then bring that worship in here with you. Because as a meaningful member, you've promised to uphold the public worship of God. And God expects us to worship Him as a church, Now, you won't find a verse that says, get together on Sunday to worship God, specifically like that. But if you read through the New Testament, you'll notice that's what they did. That's what the church does. I mean, even the the text that we just read in Hebrews implies a corporate drawing near of God, right? In the context of not forsaking yourselves together, he says, draw near to God. Jesus is the, the great high priest over the house of God. What is the house of God? It's the church. So we draw near to God. We hold fast our confession within the context of not neglecting our meeting together. So the author of Hebrews seemingly seemingly has the church in view here. And so together we should be drawing near to God as well. Yes, worship outside this building, but then when Sunday comes around, come together and worship. 1 Corinthians 14, you have detailed instructions about the use of spiritual gifts in public worship. In Acts, you find the church gathering to worship all over the place. In Acts 13, it says plainly that the church in Antioch was worshiping. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. We see corporate worship in the scriptures. So it's not good enough just to worship alone. Yes, worship alone. Worship everywhere. Worship is a way of life. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's that's worship. Yes, we do that. We should do that. We must do that. But we must not neglect worshiping together either. In Acts 2.42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. That's corporate worship. That's what's going on there. They're devoted to it. They're committed to it. They're not letting go of it. We need this, is is their attitude. And so being a meaningful member means we devote ourselves to corporate worship as well. Yes, we come together to to build each other up, but we also come together to, to lift up our Lord and Savior, 
to celebrate him. Right? That's what we're doing when we come together on Sunday. We're celebrating God. It's, it's, it's the Lord's Day, and that's what we want to do. Why? Because of how incredible he is and the incredible grace that he's shown us in Jesus Christ. And we get to do it with fellow believers, people that, that God redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. We get to come together and, and sing praises and, and hear about that God. Why would we want to skip out? <clears throat> Why would that not be a priority for us? I mean, think of it as your family dinner. I don't know if you have a meal where everybody gets together and eats. Maybe it's supper. Maybe it's breakfast. Whatever your schedule is. Right? That's what family, the Sunday worship is. I mean, right during the day, you're, you're doing your own thing at home. And so maybe you don't eat breakfast or lunch together because the kids have school or they have to be dropped off somewhere else. You've got work. Everybody's coming and going. They're not sitting together eating that family meal. But you're still eating, I hope. And then at the end of the day, you're all back together for that meal where you can reconnect and be together. That's what Sunday worship is. You know, we're scattered throughout the week. We have our jobs, we have school, doctor's appointments, running errands. And all the while, yes, we're worshiping God as individuals, but then comes Sunday, dinner time. Now it's time to come together, to reconnect, to sing together, to hear the scriptures together, to respond to scriptures together, to pray together, to encourage one another, to worship our God, the God who made us and gives us breath and, and who redeemed us from our sins. We're going to be worshiping God together as a church family in heaven. And this is a piece of heaven, a tiny piece. Why would we want to skip out? Sunday is a day for us to celebrate our Lord together. But when we, out of selfish ambition, say, oh, I'd rather go my separate way today than gathering with my blood-bought blood brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm saying, I don't have to worship God with you, with the rest of my family. It's like the, it's like the stubborn teenager who refuses to come down for supper. I'll just eat my, my food in my room. That's what it's like. Upholding the corporate worship of God is essential to our church, and it's essential to your life as well. So how do we, how do we worship God on Sunday? Well, we'll just do, go through this fairly quickly. God shows us. Preaching is worship. Maybe it's not the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of worship, but it's very much an act of worship. We re, as we read and preach through the Bible, who are we focusing on? Hopefully we're focusing on what God is saying to us. When we uphold that word, when we respond rightly to that word, that's worship. Worship is ascribing love and honor and, and wonder to God. And so looking at his word prompts that. Preaching is an act of worship, which is why you see it over and over in the New Testament an emphasis on preaching, right? Paul uh, tells Timothy, even when nobody wants to listen, preach the word. He says, give attention uh, to teaching because preaching is an act of worship. So is reading and hearing the scriptures like we do in the, uh, at the beginning. He also says to Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to the exhortation to teaching. Prayer is part of worship. The early church gatherings were marked by prayer. And Timothy, again, 1 Timothy, Paul laying out how you should behave in the church, makes a priority of praying. Pray for all men, those in authority, right? He says pray. But back in Acts 2.42, what they were devoted to, they were devoted to the prayers, to prayers, to corporate prayers. Of course, singing, right? Of course, singing, that's part of worship. That's often what we land on when we think of worship. Worship is the music. Yeah, it, it's music, but it's far more than just the music. And of course we sing. It's an important element in Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves, speaking to one another, not talking to yourself like Adam and I were talking about earlier, uh, that we talk to ourselves. It's speaking to each other, to yourselves, your church members. How do you do it? In, in, in the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. 
And Colossians 3 says the same thing in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. This is not something you can do in isolation. You can't sing to build up your church family in isolation. I probably can't sing even here to build them up. But that's not the point. We are called to gather. And these acts of worship are corporate. We gather for edification. We just looked at that. To build each other up. We gather to give. That will be another message in our, our covenant, so I won't spend any time on that. We gather to uphold the ordinances, and we'll look at that one next week. But those are part of the corporate worship of the church that we can only do together. We don't invite people over for a baptism or communion. Hey, you want to have communion with me tonight? We don't do that. It's part of the public worship of the church. And so as meaningful, committed members of East Lincoln Baptist Church, we must make it a priority to gather on Sunday as a family to corporately read the Bible, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, and see the Bible in the ordinances. All for the purpose of worshiping our God all for the purpose of drawing near to him and helping each other grow closer to him. That's why it's essential that we gather. That's why we must be here. And obviously God is the object of our worship, not you or me. That's why we can't really be like, I didn't really get anything out of the service today. Well, we weren't there to worship you. We were there to worship God. So the church is not a service station, it's not a restaurant, it's not a ball game, it's not a movie theater. It's not for us to go home and leave a Yelp review. Well, you know, the no. It's about God. Was he pleased? Was he magnified? Was he glorified? Soren Kierkegaard said, people have the idea that the preacher is an actor on a stage and they're the critics blaming or praising him. What they don't know is that they are the actors on the stage the preacher is merely the prompter standing in the wings, reminding them of their lost lines. And he says, God is the audience. But I say better, God is the object of our worship, not you or me. So better than asking, did I get anything out of the services? Did I put anything into it? What did I give to God today? And I don't mean the offering plate. I don't mean just the offering plate. That is an act of worship. I mean, how is your heart? Was it focused on him? Was it ready and willing to receive his word and submit to it? Did I offer up praises from the heart or was I just mouthing it? Did I worship him or did I mail it in that day? Because it isn't about us, it's about God. And it's about others. It's about celebrating God and building up each other. That's what we're here for. We're here to make much of God and, and build each other up because God deserves our worship. And as his family, it's, assem it's essential that we assemble together on the Lord's Day to give him the honor, adoration, praise, and worship that he deserves. And so we promise in our covenant that we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but we will uphold the public worship of God so that we might build each other up and offer up praise to our God. So I'd encourage you, in order to uphold that covenant, in order to be faithful to your God and worship him as he requires and as he deserves, structure your life around Sunday. I know things happen, work, illness, infirmity, vacations, things come up. I get that. I'm not talking about missing a, a few Sundays here and there. I'm talking about making it a priority to gather together. God sees it as one. Our covenant sees it as one. There are many desires, responsibilities, different things, hobbies that can, they can interfere with this, sure. So make getting together for the family meal your highest priority on Sunday. Sunday is the day to celebrate your Lord with your church family. Don't let anything get in the way. The local church is central to God's plan for this world. It's central for God's plan for your life. And so as we gather, our bond with each other should be strengthened. Our love for God should be deepened as we read the word, preach the word, pray the word, sing the word, and see the word. We're built up and God is magnified because there's encouragement, there's strength to be found when you look around and, and see your brother and sister or sister in Christ who, who you know is dealing with difficult things. 
And you see them here. You see them actively listening. You see them singing praise in the midst of that pain and that difficulty. There's power in that. That's why corporate worship is so important. So don't forsake the Sunday, Sunday gathering. Be faithful to God and be faithful to one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the church. We thank you for the gift of your Son who makes us a church. Father, we would ask that you would give us the strength uh, to carry out the things that you call us to carry out, that we would be faithful to gather, uh, not for ourselves, but to encourage one another, to build one another up, and more importantly, to worship you, to give you the praise, glory, and honor that you deserve. Father, help us to do that uh, as we gather, and help us to do that as well as we leave here that we would continually offer up the sacrifices of praise to you alone who is worthy. Give us the grace and strength and, and just guide and direct us and, and give us uh, the blessing that we need today as we go our separate ways and, and bring us uh, safely back this evening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.